We live in a global age. More than at any other time in history, we as humans talk to each other across the world. In order for us to communicate, we use international standards. These help us to understand each other so that we can work together and play together. In addition, the use of international standards enables all countries to trade with each other. Standards help to do away with exclusivity and they provide a level playing field that both rich and poor can take part in. The most obvious standard is the metric system. As is the nature of all standards, not only does this ease the collaboration between the nations that use it, but it also makes life simpler for the individual users. It's a decimal based system which simplifies the arithmetic used and reduces the number of units of measure required to be learnt. The legacy imperial system, for example, made use of a number of units, including inches, feet, yards and miles, whereas in the metric system this is all replaced by a single unit, the metre. The system is almost totally used throughout the world. All countries except three have officially adopted it. The three countries that have not are Myanmar, the USA and Liberia. Now standards are defined by the International Standards Organization. They define them, but they don't invent them. The origin of standards is the people who use them. It is the regular people of the world who create standards in the first place. Because they've been thought through and discussed amongst a wide number of their users, standards generally make life easier for us. The international standard for time is the 24-hour clock. In this age of global travel and communication, the standard 24-hour clock makes it so much easier to work out the time in another time zone compared with using AM and PM. Midnight is zero, zero hours, and the hours are counted throughout the whole day from zero to twenty-three. Firstly, it's shorter to write. This is particularly handy for timetables. Secondly, it's much easier to use. I live on the west coast of Canada. If I want to call my brother in the UK and want to know what time it is there, it's easy to work out. The time difference is eight hours. Using the 24-hour clock, I just add 8 to my time to get the time in the UK. If I end up with a result greater than 24, I just subtract 24 from it. If I end up with a negative number, then I add 24 to it. That's all there is to it. No need to worry about AM or PM. Just about every country in the world uses the 24-hour clock for its train and bus timetables. One of the few exceptions is the USA, who are for the most part continuing to use AM and PM. Dates are expressed verbally as either day and month, like the 1st of March, or month and day, like March the 1st. In the 1970s, when computers became popular and needed to store dates as efficiently as possible, Using numbers for the months, as well as for the rest of the date, became popular. The common convention that was adopted was day, month, year, all expressed as numbers. So, 1st of March 1975 is 1375. We could say that this became the de facto standard. It's a logical convention because we start with the smallest unit of time, the day, then progress to the month, then finish with the largest unit of time, the year. This de facto standard is commonly used in everyday life by the vast majority of the world's people. However, the de jour standard is year, month, day, with the year expressed as four digits. These two are easily distinguished from each other because the de jour standard has the year with four digits instead of two. A notable exception is the USA, who decided to be different from all other countries and use month, day, year. This presumably came about because of the way it is spoken, March the 1st, 
but then the year is added on at the end, almost as an afterthought. This inconsistency with either of the international standards has caused a lot of problems for the software industry over the last 40 years. American software companies such as Oracle and Microsoft use the American date format in the storage of dates, which causes problems for non-American programmers who are not familiar with that format. A worse problem occurs when software actually displays dates in the American format, causing problems for users. These American software companies have not considered the global market. The term internationalization is used to describe software that can be adapted for a global market, but sadly these American companies have not designed their software in this way. Many hours are spent by technical support departments dealing with this common problem. What about standards for language? Is it possible to establish international standards? After all, isn't this the main way we communicate? I'm speaking to you in English, so we'll focus on this language, but the same principles apply to other internationally used languages too. It's difficult to define standards for verbal communication. There is probably more diversity in the verbal use of the English language within England itself, where the language was developed, than there is throughout the rest of the English-speaking world. Accents in the pronunciation of words vary throughout the world, as do the use of a variety of synonyms to describe the same thing. Even in England, a certain item of furniture is described as a couch, a sofa or a settee. The written language is a different matter, and here is where we can define a standard. The standard of spelling is defined in a dictionary. As the English language became widely used, the English people established various dictionaries, the first notable one being a Dictionary of the English Language, published by Samuel Johnson in 1755. Like all standard definitions, this was developed by the people who used the standard and simply defined what was already being used. Like all standards, it has been rewritten over time as the language has evolved. The current edition is not the same as the original one. The dictionary helps in the correct use of the written language by defining the correct spelling of words. This standard of spelling has been adopted by a large extent by all English speakers throughout the world, though some countries have created their own variations. In today's world, the English-speaking nations are the United Kingdom, the United States, Australia, Canada, Ireland and New Zealand, plus a large English-speaking minority in South Africa. Of these, only the Americans have made such a major rewrite of many of the most common English words. The rest of the English-speaking world, including the, the remaining five countries, and all the countries of the world which use English as an official language, as, or as a, a major secondary language, or who have a large number of speakers, pretty much all use the same form as English as is used in England itself. The American, Noah Webster, created his own dictionary of the language. Webster was by nature a revolutionary, seeking American independence from the cultural thraldom to Britain. American nationalism was superior to Europe because American values were superior, he claimed. Webster published his first dictionary in 1806. An expanded and fully comprehensive version, an American Dictionary of the English Language, was published in 1828. Compared with the English language commonly in use in the rest of the English-speaking world, this had very different spellings for common words. Noah Webster intent on forging a distinct identity for the American language, altered spellings and accentuated differences in meaning and pronunciation of some words. His book contains 12,000 words that had never appeared previously in any dictionary. His justification for using these spellings 
was an attempt to get back to the original spelling of words. However, Webster made two big mistakes. Firstly, he did not take into account that languages evolve. The way that words are spelt today is different from how they were spelt in previous centuries. For example, in some cases, Webster had gone back to how words were spelt in Shakespearean English. This then begs the question, how far back do you go to find some pure, correct spelling? The answer is, you can't. The spelling of words evolves over time. He'd pick the Latin spelling of a word rather than the French spelling, but which is correct? Both Latin and French have been influences of the English language for hundreds of years. His attempt to research and find a more authentic spelling of words than those already in use by the English was his second mistake. Even today, Americans claim that their spelling of words is actually authentic English. But the language is called English because it is the language of the English people living in England. You can't separate a people from its language. In fact, a language helps to identify a particular people. So therefore, authentic English is the language of the English people of England, and always will be. But the English spoken there now is different from the English spoken there 200, 400, a thousand years ago. The language changes and evolves over time. But at any time in history, we can say that authentic English is the language of the English people. The correct use of the English language comes from England, where it has been passed down over the centuries in an unbroken line from generation to generation for about 1,400 years, naturally evolving along the way. The English people, as a rule, tend to take responsibility for the good use of English, with the proper use of grammar and spelling. The same is true for any language. We look to the French for the correct use of the French language, and to the Spanish for the correct use of their language. It would not seem right if the people of, say, Chile, were to say that the Spanish people were not speaking Spanish properly, and that the Spanish spoken in Chile was actually the correct definition. Given that the Americans have diversified and developed their own dictionary, many instead call this language American. This is a more appropriate name for it, and recognises and gives due credit to the nation that has developed it. As a result of Webster's work, we now have two major forms of the English language, the American version and the standard international version used by the rest of the English-speaking world, including the English themselves. The American spelling of certain words when used outside the USA, apart from in one or two other countries that have officially adopted it, is actually incorrect and would constitute a spelling mistake. Even in Canada, the standard international spelling is predominant. Conversely, the international English spelling of these words in the USA is incorrect. Dictionaries define a language, so if two countries are using different dictionaries, then they are not, wholly speaking, the same language though they may understand each other to some extent. For example, the Spanish and the Portuguese do understand each other's languages, as do the Polish and the Slovaks. At some point in history, what was once one language has become two. The Dutch, who colonised South Africa in the 17th century, continue to speak Dutch, but during the 18th century, their dialect diversified so much from the Dutch spoken in the Netherlands that it became a language in its own right, known as Afrikaans, having its own dictionary. The Afrikaans-speaking people of South Africa don't claim to be speaking Dutch. The American form of English has followed a similar history to that of Afrikaans, diversifying from the original parent language. Hence the language they speak should be recognised for what it is, a distinct language from the English spoken by much of the rest of the world. 
Some writers have attempted to combine the two forms of English together in their literature. This presents several problems. If there are several ways to spell a word, then this increases spelling errors. Because as human beings we like to have standards, and so only having one correct spelling of a word is therefore preferable. Otherwise, our ability to remember the correct spelling of all words decreases and we become bad spellers. Another problem is deciding which of the two spellings to use. Why doesn't the USA follow international standards? I've asked this question of a few Americans that I've met, and their response on each occasion is that it's due to arrogance on the part of the Americans. I do, however, find that that difficult to believe. A whole nation of people cannot be arrogant. Americans are some of the warmest and friendliest people I've met. To answer this question, we need to understand what it means to be an American. The American nation was born during the rise of Western Europe's great empires, such as the Spanish, the French, the Portuguese, the Dutch and the British empires. The USA established its independence from the British Empire in 1776. Many nations, on becoming independent of these European superpowers, tended to re-establish their original culture and language. The USA was one of the exceptions. Instead of re-establishing the culture of the Native Americans, it was the white, English-speaking people who were now in power. In order to establish their own identity, this ruling class found ways to make themselves distinct from the British. One generation after their independence was when they established the new language for themselves, Webster's English. As we've seen, this was based on the language of the British, but with many differences that made it uniquely their own. Independence is an important attitude for Americans. On the surface they appear to be similar to the British, but for Americans their differences and individuality as a nation is important. However, this prevailing attitude has tended to be extended to all other countries too. In becoming different from the British, they've set themselves to be different from the rest of the world as well. Americans pride themselves on inventions and ideas that have come from their own people but tend to be reluctant to take on inventions and ideas from other countries. This is one factor that makes them reluctant to follow international standards. Another factor is their wealth. The USA is currently the world's richest single country, so it's perhaps true that they don't feel any particular need to adopt international standards. They seem to be managing okay without them, at least for the time being. The European Union is actually the world's richest market entity and this does adopt and encourage the use of standards which have helped in trade agreements within the Union. Many other countries with a high gross domestic product such as Qatar, Singapore, China, India and Japan have also adopted international standards to their benefit. The Americans are lovely people, warm-hearted, outgoing, friendly and with a positive attitude. It's the American people themselves who suffer most for their lack of international standards. Living within their own country they are fine, but travelling abroad or communicating with foreigners presents problems for them. Even travelling just across their borders into Canada or Mexico can make shopping or understanding the weather difficult for them. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. It's time the Americans adopted the metric system. Their military already use it, and so can the rest of the country. Similarly, they should adopt the 24-hour clock. The American date format should not be used anywhere outside the USA. The Americans' best way to follow the international date format would be to increase the use of the de jour international standard, year, month, day. The American language should be clearly defined as a language in its own right, distinct from standard international English. As far as possible, all English literature should be indicated which of these two it is written in. 
This would be of particular benefit to speakers of other languages who are learning English, as it would help to avoid confusion in spelling. Thank you.